So we lo- okay. So yeah, let's get started. Thank you very much, Gav, for doing this. I actually, I, I will be very honest. I missed this environment, you know, because this year has been a very different year for all of us. So it's nice to be able to share some stuff with other artists. So thank you for me yeah, to the CG for... core and and <laughs> thanks for doing the streams as well. All the problem. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for yeah. for coming. Uh, no worries. But well, I guess uh, this is going to be the most unorganized one I ever ha- had because usually I have like a very well prepared PDF because it's always like I know how much time I have. Uh, but obviously I haven't done it for a while. So today it's going to be a very experimental one because I actually wanted uh, uh, like, yeah, I will show you some work probably on my art station, which probably most of you have seen. If not, you can just go and check out my work. Uh, but I also wanted to kind of show the backstage of the process because most of the time you see this facade of artwork, you know, we've been like my fellow colleagues posting online, like we worked on this movie and that movie. And it could be very <laughs> discouraging, actually. It was when I was starting out because I would see all this beautiful work and I would imagine, oh my God, how are they doing this? And also like, what is the kind of the schedule they have and this is probably one of the most common questions i get asked like how do i organize myself so hopefully i'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of that uh if you don't mind and also as i'm i will be doing and showing you some stuff feel free to ask me questions but let let's keep them related to what i'm doing because we i think like gav correct me if i'm wrong we will have like a proper q a session where you guys can randomly ask me questions so yeah, the first correct. part i I would prefer you asking me questions regarding the process and exactly like matching to what I'm doing or what I'm showing to you. And then I can take any questions you want afterwards. Uh, okay, that sounds good. Right. So, so then I'll, I'll read you, to you questions that are related to what you're exactly. going to be doing. And then exactly. I'm going to, uh, once you're done, then we're going to do the general one later. Exactly. All right. All right. For those who don't know me, just I know there are people like that. So. My name is Jamal Jorabayev, and I work as a freelance concept artist and art director. And originally, I'm from Tajikistan, uh, but I live and uh, work in London, UK. Uh, so, yeah, if you just go on my webpage, which is it is officially my webpage now, artstation slash Jama, and you can see all the work I've done. And it's just a collection of bunch of stuff I'm doing. This is not a professional portfolio. It's just me just posting whatever I'm doing. And uh, most of the time, even if you don't know me, if you go on this uh, and check out my website, you can go like, what? Like, it looks like this guy is doing everything, right? Like I do characters, I do environments, I do sketches, I do a lot of 3D. I actually do a bit of everything. And I I think like this is where we can take this conversation from. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoy being able to tackle different uh, aspects of this work. And by this work, I mean concept art. This, this is primarily what I do. Uh, and obviously, usually people ask me, like, how do you get time to learn all this stuff, right? So, again, like, looking by the portfolio I have here, it looks like yeah, I know a little bit of sculpting. I know a little bit of about drawing, painting, 3D, 2D. It looks like there is a lot of work and kind of study behind it. And you're right. <laughs> There's a lot of work behind it. And this is what I wanted to kind of start from and tell you. The way I tackle this and the way like the way I build my philosophy around learning new things and trying to also keep myself happy. So obviously the reason why I, I, I kind of tend to learn and like improve myself in different areas, it's a very personal choice. You know, like I often when people ask me like is it necessary to know all this stuff? I I would say yes and no. I mean like you know a lot of very successful artists out there who do only one specific thing like they only do 3d or 2d or they even do only one uh, specific type of work it's either max or guns and this is amazing you know it just shows you that you don't necessarily know to know, need to know everything as, as long as you have a very good design sense and as long as you have a very solid foundation then you can specialize on something very even very narrow and become very successful uh, but I just have a very natural curiosity, you know, it's just my personal preference. It's not like someone is forcing me, but I'm just, I love it, you know? And I think this is, this is where, if you are kind of trying to figure out where you want to go, this is the first question you need to ask yourself, are you enjoying this? Right? Like, no, and again, like today, 
I think the most difficult part is not actually finding a source material, right? Because there are so many gum roads out there. There are so many events like this, like where you can ask professionals what to do. And obviously, when you have that, the downside of it, you, you're getting a constant barrage of information, right? You're getting a, a lot of great information, actually. And I, I think, like, I feel lucky that I already know a lot of things because I didn't, I, if I was, like, just trying to learn right now, it would be occasionally quite confusing because you will get all these sources and you will have to figure out which one do you need to uh, go for to make your own kind of style or you know, basically to specialize yourself in and i would say always follow not your instinct but just there's just one measure to it if you're enjoying the process then it will you will have eventually more chances to improve yourself in that area that's why but then saying that i also think like a lot of stuff that i do and i will show some of that stuff as well is not that super fun you know it's just like a very hard working stuff where you're trying to let's say you're trying to learn anatomy and you're just like looking at bones and trying to memorize them and all that stuff it's it's fun but it's not something like you put out there and people go oh wow this this is looking great it's just something that you do for yourself that's why uh like first part would be just do what you think you're enjoying you know this because otherwise it's almost it's it's very difficult to improve on something if you're not enjoying it even though if you know it's necessary that's why, like, you either need to make it in a way it's, you enjoy it, or you maybe just need to tell yourself, oh, this is not my thing, you know? And then, like, let's say if you're not enjoying 3D and it's happening, like, years after years, maybe it's not something you should be doing first. Maybe you go back to 2D and then go back to 3D. But, again, at every case, in, in like, I've been teaching a lot as well lately. I can see that I can show you the way I do things, but most of the time after this, it's on your end. You need to find your own way of doing things. Uh, and once you, it, it's it kind of like once you start enjoying it, it becomes like exponentially, you become more and more successful in what you do because you find your own combination. And also the reason why I love this profession is because it's it's creative based. Uh, there's so many different ways of doing the same things. and almost there are almost like limitless amount of combinations you can either improve yourself in 3d or in 2d it's purely up to you you just need to find your own way of doing things but obviously once you like let's just i will take my own experience and show you my own example uh, because of my natural curiosity of like trying to learn a lot of things i understand that then i i, I have a problem of timing right for example Yes, you, you, in theory, you can learn anything you want, like, and anytime you want. Like, you can start at 40s and you can still learn it. But obviously, as we know, the older you get, the less kind of uh, time you have. And also, obviously, the learning ability is kind of declining. At, at least this is something happening to me. And I, I, all of this is correlated, obviously. But that's why, like, I need to be very cautious about the way I do things. And I need to sort of pre-plan my uh, studies and pre-plan the way I tackle certain uh, explorations in my life. Also, don't forget that like I work all, like full time on professional projects, so this is like almost becomes like a very important chunk of your daytime. And then somehow I, I I'm also curious learning uh, other things. That's why, for example, this is something that I already showed you on this channel when we had this brief stream, um, the first ever time I joined CG Core. Like I showed this to a bunch of guys. Maybe some of you have seen it. But for example, what I do, I have this folder. Uh, it's called dailies. So right now you're seeing like this is the, the folder on my machine. And it's basically a bunch of, a collection of bunch of sketches. I probably never posted maybe a couple of this, but most of them is just for my, for my own kind of studies. You know, I'm, it, like today it's kind of challenging because we have social media and almost there is temptation to share everything you do which is fantastic by the way i really encourage you guys uh, be, uh, to share your work uh, but obviously sometimes it becomes you work to share and this is where it becomes very dangerous territory uh, and that's why like all, most of the time when i do my own studies i 
I don't have tendency like to put it out uh, anywhere. I just do it for myself. There's no pressure because the main thing I'm trying to do here is just to learn, right? And th I'm doing this, for example, when I'm fully busy with like heavy 3D stuff, I still like devote like some time of my day. And for example, obviously I don't do it every day. Like you can see this, this is called dailies, but I have this dates here, but obviously I don't do it every day because it's not like, I'm not in prison, right? There's no like very uh, strict schedule or something like that. I'm I'm just doing it whenever I have time. And yeah, like I can show you a bunch of this. Was it just like, so what I was showing to you guys is was just like random work that I do on a daily basis. And the, the, the spread of work is very different. Like sometimes I do live drawing kind of exploration. Sometimes I do like mechanical things, just taking notes. I, I know it's flipped, but I'm pretty sure like it's something perspective or forms related. So it's always like a conscious effort to learn something, you know? It's, again, what I mentioned today, it's so easy to get this. There's a huge temptation to put out stuff so people can see it and they can value it. And I think this is amazing that you you are able to do that. But also, it's all about balance. You know, once this, if this starts driving your studies and that's all you do, then you're basically just trying to get likes. I know it, it, it sucks, but this is pretty much what it becomes. And that's why, like, I often balance it with, like, with the work I never show to anyone. I just enjoy the process. I'm just trying to learn something. Like, I either pick up, like, a hand I would love to study I I pick up like a feed or like some animals. And in the end, this helps me to explore the areas where I'm not good at, you know, like, and eventually this is something that I will be able to use it in my work, you know? And obviously this is something I enjoy doing. If you, if you want to do something similar, it doesn't necessarily need to be exactly what I'm doing. Like, for example, let's say you want to become better at guns, right? So every day you can do studies in guns or like vehicles or like, creature design like there's so much to explore you know as long as you every day I, I mean by every day i mean constantly if you're trying to push yourself and you're constantly curious to improve yourself uh it's a very healthy environment because also it keeps you very diverse if you know i, I i'm pretty sure like most of you like have this sensation when you work for clients at some point you go like, oh man i wish i could do some of my personal projects right and unfortunately, the problem with personal projects, because there's no deadline and there's no client behind on, on that end who demands from you things, it becomes very difficult to finish everything, right? That's why, like, my first approach to deal with that is just do this daily exercise. There's no deadline. There's no meaning to them. I mean, I, I, I kind of, like, try to improve my painting and drawing skills in this type of exercise, but there's no, like certain thing that i want to achieve because i want to keep it loose i want to enjoy it and as you can see like i it, it's just like a, a set of bunch of different exercises sometimes i do color studies sometimes i do like figure drawings and yeah and i keep it constant i keep it doing that on a constant basis that's what it, what that, that's what is very important uh because this keeps me always fresh keeps me motivated and also kind of distracts me from my main work that I do on, on also on a daily basis. Yeah, so let me just quickly scroll through this stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Like for example, pick up some skulls and I do some full figures. I also have a, uh, the, the, these are almost anatomy studies, but I do have tons of different things. Like for example, I, I do like just quickly like some vehicles, some like, this is not mine by the way. Yeah, some some di dropping like different ideas trying to figure out and occasionally what i end up having like i come up with different ideas for my next projects when i do this because these are so relaxed you know these are not like someone is forcing me sometimes i spend maybe a half an hour in the morning just like trying to sketch out something and if i find something interesting i take notes and i may i could end up reusing it somewhere else which is really nice uh, obviously, I do have the same stuff, but for 3D things. Uh, like, I have this folder here. Obviously, there, there are no thumbnails, but I do pretty much the similar stuff with 3D. I just, like, open Blender or open 3D code or whatever program I'm trying to uh, learn. And I'm I'm just doing pretty much the same exercise. And again, doing it on a constant basis, on a daily basis, helps me to basically 
battle with the problem I have constantly, which is lack of time, right? Uh, for example, well, especially when you're starting working as a professional, you find yourself in, a, in the environment where it's super demanding, like at least eight hours a day you have to work, plus you have to commute and all this stuff. And you also want to do your personal projects, but then we have tons of other different things like personal life, family, and how do you balance that? That's like the main question. And probably because I do a lot of things, people ask me about this. And I always say like, if you want to deal with that and if you want to still be motivated and growing, you got to do your personal projects. But obviously, like I, I showed you in the first part, uh, one way of doing it is just doing daily exercises, you know? And again, it's not like our life is not the prison, you know, or not like something very strict. You don't need to, you don't have to do it every day, but uh, if you stretch it out, like imagine a year, right? Uh, if you stretch out your daily exercises throughout the year, you can learn so much, even if it's a half an hour a day. Uh, let's say you want to learn anatomy, or let's say you want to learn more about hard surface modeling. Uh, that's what will make a difference, you know. Uh, you know, there's the famous saying that five percent of extra work that you put on top always makes a difference. It does actually, you know, uh, because it will make uh, those five percent. If you do it every day, it will pile up in a very huge amount of work that you can. Uh, you will be putting in into something, you know, and eventually it will help you to grow. Obviously, it doesn't necessarily need to be a year. Sometimes it takes two, three, five years. But in the end, if you constantly keep practicing that, that it will get you somewhere. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is actually, let's say, of course, like daily exercises, if you, as you've seen, um, they take like very little amount of time, right? For example, as I mentioned, like sometimes I spend half an hour a day, sometimes I spend an hour a day. But still, I think like it's very limited amount of time because I'm stretching it out like throughout like a year, a span of a year or two, this in the end becomes like a quite significant amount of time. But I also felt like, especially this has happened to me this year, uh, oh, towards the end of this year, I felt like, damn it, I'm, I haven't learned anything for a long time. I know like I've been teaching a lot i've been sharing a lot but uh, there were some areas that i wanted to improve myself right and one of them was specifically sculpting uh because as a nature of my work i do sculpting right i did a lot of sculpting on jurassic world on other projects i worked on but i always felt it's always always was half baked so i would do something decent and then i would move on and i i i was very like there was a lot of pressure on i was putting a lot of pressure on myself in terms of damn, I want to learn it, but I don't have time, right? The same issue, there's always never enough time. And this is where I was like, I need to just stop doing client work. I know this is this could be very um, tricky to do, especially if your main income uh, depends on, on your regular work. But I just felt if I don't do it now, like I will probably never do it in the span of the next five or 10 years, you know? And I just like stopped taking any client work. I had no upcoming projects as well. I just felt like for half a year, I'm gonna like, oh, for a year, I'm, I'm gonna just devote my time learning this. And well, I don't I don't think I can call it fortunately or unfortunately, but then COVID situation happened and eventually, and I was like, you know, like the industry kind of went down and I, I was like, oh, well, I, I made it the right choice, right? But I'm not proud of that, obviously, but it was just like a very weird coincidence where I was just kind of focusing on my personal projects and then kind of this whole virus situation happened. So there's always like, I think like the two lessons that I learned from there is that like leaving it, like stop taking per commercial projects is not always the end of the world. You know, it, it also depends on where you are in your career. I felt like I've been working in the industry for quite some time and I, I felt like it would be nice to have a break and just concentrate on something that I enjoy, like fully enjoy. Like it's not like I'm not I wasn't enjoying my work. But again, personal projects are the ones that will give you the creative boost that you need because in the end, like you wake up in the morning and you do something for yourself, right? And it's it's very rewarding. And I, I really enjoyed it. I'm still enjoying it, obviously. Since then, I started doing taking client work as well. But there was like three or four months when I had fully full time to devote to my own 
the skills and develop my own stuff. It, it's really rewarding. Those kind of sabbaticals are very important to take. It doesn't necessarily need to be three or four months. Like for example, you can get, take a week off or two weeks off. Uh, and it just helps you tremendously. You know, it helps you to recharge yourself as well because in the end, like client work could be very stressful, right? When you're working with clients, it's rewarding. It's fun to do, but also... There's a lot of pressure because the pressure is on both ends, right? If you're working with a director, a director has a, a pressure from producers and from a, a studio, and then you have a pressure to deliver certain things. But when you're doing your own projects, it's just, you can enjoy that time. You can do exactly what I showed with those daily exercises. Be slower and just do, just enjoy the journey, you know, just to, kind of learn new things. So I did sculpting, but obviously I had a lot of different other projects that I was doing parallel to this. Uh, and one of them was uh, this project that I was doing, which is uh, big, medium, small. So what is big, medium, small? Is This, is, this started way back when I did, uh, I guess, let me show you it here. Or is it like, yeah, I did this Templars kind of series of images, which I, which I really enjoyed. I like kind of period images. And uh, I felt like, oh, damn, I wish I had time to do more of this, right? But then again, the same problem, like you want to do personal stuff, but you never have proper time to do that. So I waited, I waited like for two years, like this, this image when I posted it was like three or yeah, three years ago. And I waited for two years and then Finally, when I had a chance to work on my personal stuff again, I picked it up. So this is also very important. And a lot of us do this, including me. I do it all the, I do it all the time when we, we never finish our personal projects. So again, like I mentioned before, the problem with personal projects is that because there's no client on the other end, you, you started out. And when you just started out, it sounds so cool, so amazing, and you're just enjoying it. But as you're doing it, you go like, oh, my God, this is so like it's either becomes boring or you don't think it's original enough. So we've got a lot of projects collecting dust on our shelves, right? Like if you look at your own studies, you probably will see a lot of projects like this. So I like always try to tend, I, I try to tend to finish my projects. It's very important. Then it becomes something that I can learn by doing it. And then also it becomes something that I can see the result in the end, right? So we did the series of, and I partnered with a good, friend of mine, Oleg, who's a fantastic artist himself. So we did this project, Big, Medium, Small. It, it, it was basically our passion to create like characters. And we also wanted obviously to make them look really cool and make something that we could share with other artists so they can use it as well. Because most of the time when you're working on real projects, you don't have physical time unless you're doing like a proper design work or like it's either a character. But let's say, for example, I'm doing an environment like you see over here. Just scroll up. Yeah. If I'm doing an environment like this as a part of a story of a movie I'm working on, I don't have time to model all this stuff, right? It's just impossible. Like, usually the time you've given on this would be like two, three days maximum, right? As a concept artwork. Uh, but then just modeling every single of these characters will take probably like, especially I'm not a decent character modeler, it will take me a lot of time. So, we wanted to do something that we can share with other artists so they can use it. So we ended up eventually uh, creating like a bunch of really nice Templars and this pack was out there and people were able to create fantastic work with it. But then also what I loved about this project, it allowed me to travel. Like we were traveling around UK, uh, visiting all these like historical places. I was like, damn, this is so much fun. You know, like this is exactly... Uh, where your personal passion becomes like gives you a lot of uh, like happiness, I would say it gives you a lot of positive vibes, and we really enjoyed it. But obviously, uh, after that, like we started a new one, and that took us exactly a year to do. But finally, here we go. This is our next uh, set that uh, I already started teasing uh, on my social media. But uh, let me just show you the pictures first. I'm not sure why this is a bit heavy then i'm going to show you a free part of it so let me pull up some images for you yeah. 
Yeah, that blended file is gonna crash my computer. So yeah, so here we go. So this guy's here. As you can see, like it's the same thing, like with, like, and we started this like when actually again, like this this is a pure coincidence that this whole virus situation happened when we started out. This, the virus wasn't out there. We like obviously we're very inspired by the movie Chernobyl, and we we're like, oh, let's, we like, uh, and obviously for this pack, I teamed up with more people. We have fantastic other artists, Andre and Jocelyn and Oleg himself. So we came together. We all came. We're all coming from ex-Soviet Union republics. So like all this like Chernobyl kind of atmosphere is very close to where we come from. So we decided, hey, we like this. We let's put our passion into it. And we ended up the, the, like developing, like modeling all these guys here. I'm just gonna quickly scroll through this and show you some stuff we did. So these are all like super high detailed, like game ready assets. So you can take them and like recreate them in any kind of setting. So they're very optimized, very nice, uh, very, like low poly and the textures are so nicely done and stuff. So yeah, well, let me just scroll. Yeah, as you can see, like the topology is very cool. So we we kind of like spend a good chunk of time on doing this. Is and this is where I I wanted to mention another important thing. You know, I think like these days everything is becoming all about speed, right? Like let's do it very quickly. Let's do it very quickly. But I also I actually think the older I become, I think good work needs time. You know, like good work. Uh, needs like proper time uh, dedicated to to do something decent. Uh, obviously, speed is important, but it's less the speed how you like physically how fast you do it. It's not the how physically fast you move your mouse. It's more about decision making, right? Like for example, you look at the per like, like the character and you uh, the speed at which you can define the areas that needs to be corrected. That speed is important, not like like to do this glove, it probably I don't know. Like it probably took a week for a guy to do, but we, I, and I'm just making up numbers. We 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 wanted to make sure it looks good. So a, a good stuff takes time. And same with the with my client work. You know, when you work on films, uh, you're always given enough time. You know, because people who you work with, they most of them are artists as well. They understand that it takes time. So I. I believe it's not about the speed at which you move your mouse and your whack and pen. It's more the speed of decision making, you know, how fast you can figure out what is wrong with your composition or with your proportions and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, so we, we did a bunch of those guys and yeah, you can see that this, this is the army. So also what we wanted to do here also make sure that, like for example, most of the time posing characters takes a lot of time. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we do something that we can just have a default poses that people can choose from, or if I'm using it for my personal stuff. And like, because you can get a very nice character in T pose, but then reposing it and like reusing it in your scenes, it's quite tricky. So we pre made these poses, and all these characters they come with the rig. So at any point, if you want to tweak the poses, you can just uh, change them quickly. Also, we have a bunch of vehicles. So uh, again, with this, with the same realm. We wanted to recreate this kind of post-apocalyptic environment, so we spent a lot of time traveling around the world and just scanning all these different vehicles. Obviously, these are very Soviet-based vehicles. Yeah, and also optimizing them. Like one for tricky part here was you can get the scans and very impressive scans, but most of them are very heavy. Uh, they like you can have one, two, three, five of them in the scene. But once you start multiplying it, like for example, the vehicles we have here, we can have thousands of them in Blender or any 3D package you want. So yeah, so we did cars. And again, they're all very well optimized and stuff like that. Let me actually show you this 3D file uh, if I can. And it's very slow. I think it's because I'm streaming. Oh no, this is embarrassing. Okay, let me just swap to. Um, yeah, whenever I'm streaming, I have this 
performance drop in my on my computer. Bear with me for a second. So yeah, like the way we build it, like we really wanted, like the way I approached this project was like, what if, if I wanted to use this pack, how would I want it to be, right? And as I mentioned, I wanted some, the characters to be optimized. We ticked off that box. All these characters are super optimized. You can use them in your project. And the second part was I really wanted them to have rigs so I can pose them and also have some poses by default. And for example, the way it works, like you can select a pose for this character. You go here and like you press and you just activate that pose and bam, you have this guy. So it's very easy. I mean, this is obviously in Blender, but you can, I'm not sure if you can, you can do default poses. That's why like we will also offer like uh, FB access where you have the poses baked in. But what, what is great about it, like for example, let's say you, you're doing a project and you have, you need a similar pose, but obviously slightly tweak it, right? Like say, let's say in your story, this guy needs to be looking maybe sideways, right? So all you need to do, you just go to pose and because the rig is there, you can just like play with it, just change it. Yeah, maybe he wanted to move his head, maybe he's just grabbing something like that. So very cool. And because the quality of this, is quite high. It looks it looks like scan, you know, because we did like proper job on the textures. It's really fascinating. Like you get a fantastic result. They are very optimized. They are very low poly, uh, and then you obviously have the full control of what you can do with those. You know, like and again, like you can always save your poses. Like for example, let's say this guy was walking, right? Like you can very quickly tweak it. And now all of a sudden I have like a very custom pose. So yeah, this this one was another passion project of mine. I felt like I it will take some time, but the moral here is that good things take time. You know, like if you have your pro project in your mind, don't rush it. You know, I I know there's a tendency to put stuff out there so people can appreciate what you do, but the more time you spend on it, the better it becomes. Obviously. There is also the downside of it that most of our projects we tend to spend too much time and never finishing them. So yeah, this project took took us a year, but we learned so much, and we are I'm personally very proud of the work that guys have done and I, we 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 have done together. It's just very very nice. And it, yes, it took an, a, a year to do, but who cares? In the end, we have it. So right now we're actually working on the next one. So we are doing several packs uh, parallel to each other. So hopefully. In a month or two, you will see some more updates. And again, it's good for you guys to see that it took so long because, like, usually when I put stuff out there, people go, "How? When do you find time to do all these things?" You know, first I'm not doing this alone. I'm finding a people to partner with, people who have the same passion for certain things. And also, obviously, it takes. I, I we would start it way back, and like by the time we roll out, we'll probably have been working on it for like really, really long time. Okay, so. And then once uh, I took my time off, I, I started working on another project of mine, which was, uh, as you know, like lately I've been working a lot in Blender and just in general, uh, like the way I work in 3D, I don't think it's very special way I do, like the way I work, it's not like the, any, any different from the way other people work. Uh, but I think what is different about my workflow I tend to use it always, almost as, as a 2D process, right? So because I'm coming from a 2D background uh, and drawing and painting is really one of the biggest passions of mine. Uh, so when I started using 3D, I always felt like I am either using 3D workflow where it's just 3D, like the 3D, the way we know it, or I'm using it, I'm using 2D. So those worlds, those worlds were very separated from each other. So. First, it happened to me with 3D code, which is which I still use these days, but mo uh, most of the time I use Blender. But then 
the way I, I started using 3D code was very similar to the way I was using um, uh, 2D, you know, almost like I was using Photoshop. So I was like, damn, this is like great. I'm really enjoying this workflow. And again, remember when we started this conversation, as long as you enjoy what you're doing, uh, you, like you exponentially just grow because everything you do is fun for you. You know, it doesn't become a torture. And I think I found like a perfect way for myself to do it in 3D. Like, especially with 3D code, I was super happy the way I was able to use it as a 2D program. And then uh, I obviously I started using Blender and I, f I felt like, damn, this program also has this full potential to, to be that. And again, like this is something I've showed a lot. I'm not going to show it today, but uh, obviously when I, uh, Grease Pencil was the opening kind of stage of me using uh, 3D packages as a as a, as a two D application, you know where where you can basically draw things, and you can have some r really quick results. And for me, as a concept uh, concept artist, is it was sufficient enough uh, to be able to approach it this way. But then, with the modeling part of it, I also felt like, damn, like I need to find a way to basically adapt my three D code workflow into Blender. And here, obviously. I, I, I had a very clear vision, but I don't have technical skills to be able to code it. And we partnered with a good friend of mine, Alexander, who's a coding genius. He's just like crazy talented concept artist, but he turned out to be a very talented uh, coder as well. So we created this uh, add-on called Speedflow, uh, not Speedflow, sorry for that. It's called QuickShape. So yeah, so QuickShape is something that we spent roughly a year on it's like it, it was a crazy journey but I, I I'm, I'm very satisfied the way it turned out it's just super super cool so the way quick shape works and basically the the name is self-explanatory it's just it's, it's just an add-on for quick shapes right for example you can do stuff you can just draw things and then nothing happens so let me just close this monster file here with 4k textures here yeah yeah again as you can see like you draw shapes and then you just start like creating something really fast and again you can change your shapes for example you can go and just lasso your shapes it's very like 2d approach so for example let's say uh obviously you've got all the good things like mirroring uh for example let's say you want to draw a shape right for example you can let's do like quick shape like this so once you've got mirror you, you this could be uh this could be useful for anything you know it's starting from like art surface stuff but you can do very organic things you can do like max and all this stuff and there are tons of options obviously this is not a quick shape so i'm just going to show you like a general overview let me just quickly do it uh, from the beginning so for example let me see <clears throat> let me do it like this for example, something like that. So it's almost like you're doing 2D shapes, right? You did, you would do it in Photoshop or something like that, right? And for example, if I want to do like a Mac design or something like that. I know this is a very primitive Mac design, but it's just all about simple shapes, right? And then like you can start moving things around. And because all of this are low, like, like low poly, you can uh, just quickly block out things. Yeah, and what do you do next from here? It's really up to you. Like, like once you block out the main stuff, you can either like select it, like convert it to mesh, and now you can just go and start sculpting on it, right? You can do the sculpting, you can start smoothing it out and stuff like that. So it's basically like, uh, it just perfectly shows the name which it has. It's It's meant for quick shapes, you know, like you just like specialize on like, blocking out very basic shapes. And this is how most of the design work starts when you're working on any kind of design projects. You know, you don't start with details. You start with the overall shapes and then you kind of start zooming into it. And again, like once you do that, you can always go back and for example, start, oops, for example, let's say I'm gonna cut out this part. Maybe I'm gonna cut out this part so you can start separating things, you see? 
And you can you have very precise tools like you have end guns, you have circles. But I like I really love lasting, you know, because uh, of course like my lines are quite clean because I have a lot of experience. But again, I I rely on on my two D skills a lot. So I'm trying not just like use three D application, but I'm trying to utilize my two D knowledge. You can start like doing this all this and insets, and then you can cut things out. Like for example, say you can go here. Let's change the brush size. Uh oh, what happened? Yeah. So you can start extruding things like this. So yeah, like in, in one minute, we have a very solid base to work from. And from here, you can either paint over it or you can refine it. Oh, most of the time, like for me, I know I'm working in a team with the fantastic 3D modelers if, if I'm working on a project, all I they expect from me is just ideas. So once I nail the idea, like figure out figuring out all the topology and all the kind of technical aspect of it, there will be someone else to do that. That's why like like this add-on became became very, very handy and just like exponentially allowed me to concentrate just on the creative side of it rather than on the technical aspect of it. And that's what exactly I was dreaming of. Uh, let me show you another very interesting thing that we introduced with this add-on. Uh, and this is a very interesting workflow. So it's basically this metabol workflow. And you know, like, I think the most difficult part in any kind of software, obviously it's way easier in CAD modeling, but CAD modeling comes with some other stuff, which I find very difficult, uh, is blending between two shapes, right? Uh, if you have like a circle, like a cylinder, and you have like a square, uh, like a box and just blending between those two becomes very tricky. Uh, and this is something we started playing with, uh, with metables. And basically what metables do, it's the shapes that merge together as you move them closer to each other. And then from here, because you can just draw them, oh man, this is so cool. You can do so many, like, let's say you're doing like a vehicle design like something flying or something like that, you can very quickly do it. And you see, the, like, the moment you move things around, it starts merging them, so it creates a very natural kind of transition between those two. So, just do like a primitive flying vehicle or something. And here you've got, like, different options. You can use, like, capsules, so metabols comes with different options so for example say if i want to create like some sort of engines right so i put them here and you see the way it kind of automatically merges them it's really nice yeah and then at any point you can it's like a hybrid workflow where you can just for example convert this this to geo and now you can go just for example cut cut out those areas and now it became like a normal modeling process you know you can always extrude things do same here first yeah so again this is not like a perfect 3d modeling uh, approach but it's a very creative driven process so you i can Concentrate less about how do I create this transition, you know? It's something that you can figure out down the line. You know, what all I, I'm worried about right now is just like, how can I achieve something that I have in my mind? For example, I do this cut for this flaps here, you know, I can, I can start thinking about how this stuff moves and stuff like that. Yeah. So that, that was one of the other passions that I had was, how can I create tools that will make my process seamless you know uh, and make sure that i utilize everything i know you know one of them is very strong 2d background but also use the power of 3d which is obviously allows you like to create all these complex shapes and render them afterwards so yeah and we teamed up with alexander and we created this add-on and we keep developing and there's so many cool uh, other things coming uh, to this one i wanted to show you a very quick final one for this quick shape. So basically what we can do also, uh, let me just uh, create like a cube for you here. So if you go inside it, like in edit mode, uh, you can actually 
create cuts like this. So basically it's just like create a cut and you can do that, which is obviously already super useful, you know, like you can do all those different things and you can do like uh, define bevels and all that stuff, but I, I just want to keep it very simple. Uh, but the reason why I think this tool is very powerful, let me show it to you. If I import, uh, like, let me go to here. Just pull up. Second. Just a second. Yeah, so let me just create a new file here for you and then import just planes. Okay, so for example. Let's have a look at this example here. Uh, also, the way I, I work, like I mentioned, it's a hybrid workflow be between 2D and 3D, you know? Uh, because I understand that most of the time I don't need very clean, detailed geometry because I always can rely on my painting skills, right? So I can just go in and paint over uh, uh, over my 3D models. I That's why I use a lot of photos as well. But then I felt like, how can I use photos and 3D and combine them straight straight away in, in, in Blender, for example? And this is where this add-on becomes very handy. For example, let's say I can pick up this image that I took in France, and I want to recreate this as a 3D object, but I don't want to sculpt and make like proper modeling because my job is not that. My job is just to come up with this whole environment, and maybe this door is just like a very small part of it but I still want it to look good in my scene. So yeah, and this is where I, uh, we adapted Quick Shape to work with this. So all you need to do is just like set up depth to zero. And now look at that, like you can just go here. And yeah, you can start modeling with it. So like all this stuff here, you can just cut it out and extrude it. So the more I work on this, the more like stuff I could extrude, like for example, all this stuff over here. And do it like this. So now slowly, all of a sudden from a very simple geometry, it starts becoming like a 3D object. And then like, obviously you have this stuff over here. You can either use like automatic UVs. So the moment you extrude it kind of generates UVs or you can just basically manually uh, reproject the UVs. But then obviously, and in vanilla Blender, which is just default Blender, you can do all this stuff, but you you can you have only one tool, which is knife tool, right? So you can you have to go and like use the knife tool and, and do this and that, and it just takes a lot of time. In, in our case, like with the, with this add-on, we have a bunch of tools. Like for example, I can go here, select lasso, and look at that. So I can go and just like lasso this out very quickly. Doesn't need to be perfect. Oops, obviously. So we do that, and then you can just extrude it slightly, and then you can do. So it's less precise, but again, super fun to do, you know? Uh, because it's freehand, it's like combining this 2D, 3D technique and using this stuff, you can really boost and you can really speed up the technical process. So again, then you can concentrate on the bigger picture, on the more creative side of things, right? Rather than thinking about like, how can I make this look realistic? You just use a texture as a base and then kind of extrude it primitively like I did here. And you're already like from certain angles. It looks fantastic. So again, and again, just to kind of summarize this part here, like I, I really wanted to marry those two disciplines that I, I, I kind of explore on a daily basis. You know, three D and two D part, 
they're all fun, but instead of keeping them very separated, which I felt it was uh, in a way I was using it, I was like, okay, you're doing all those daily exercises, you're drawing a lot, you're painting a lot, but then when you're doing 3D, you're using none of that. And I was like, well, true. <laughs> and that's why I came like, whatever I do with my workflow and whatever I do with my time, uh, learning and improving my skills, I try to marry those two worlds. So they kind of like, if I'm improving my painting and drawing that directly improves my 3D skill and vice versa, you know, because as I showed you here, the way I use 3D is very 2D dri technique driven, you know, like I'm, I do like sometimes occasionally do proper 3D modeling, but most of the time is this hybrid uh, kind of workflow of 2D and 3D. Yeah, I guess that would be it from my end. I, I showed you a bunch of things. Uh, and the bottom line would be, if you guys want to improve in something, first you need to enjoy it. <laughs> but in order to uh, enjoy it, uh, you kind of need to find what really excites you. And that's what I do. Like, there's no like schedule. There is no, like, I don't have any plan. And I, it's not like I'm waking up every morning and I go like, let me learn something. Let me improve this area or that area. First, I do it on a daily basis. I do a little bit every day or at least like constantly, I would say. And second, I come up with the projects that excite me. Let's say, I wanted to do add-ons, but I don't. I didn't know how to code. Obviously, I partnered with the with the right person. Same on other projects. If you you don't need to learn everything and to do everything yourself, there are always other people out there who are better than you. You just need to find right people and team up with them. Like for example, let's say I I saw this a lot in my students who are like they would take my class, but then they would keep staying in touch because they had a similar kind of mindset and they would just constantly push each, uh, each other so that's that i think this is the key factor these days that you can team up with other artists you know and i think like this channel is perfect place for it you know where you can not just like do something to get likes on facebook and instagram which is fantastic by the way but you can dedicate your time improving your skills but also staying motivated and staying like really excited about things that's the only way you can do it. Otherwise, it becomes very boring. It becomes like a torture, and, and you don't want to be there. Cool. I think, Gav, I, I, now I can take on. questions. Awesome. awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for uh, the presentation. By the way, super cool to see uh, do those 3D shapes so fast. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to go from, uh, I guess, the order in which they were um, written. Question mm -hmm. from uh, Dragon Spartan. Mm -hmm. says, Gemma. Mm -hmm. Uh, is Blender used a lot at Marvel? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I have a few friends in, uh, at Marvel, but I don't know. I have no idea. I, I guess, like, I, I don't know. Obviously, I didn't know the reason why the question was asked, but if I, I would want to expand on it, like, being used somewhere, it's not a measure of a good software or something like that. I mean, Blender is a fantastic software. If people at Marvel are using it, it's great. If not, it doesn't mean anything, you know? But maybe your question was towards do like bigger studios use uh, Blender, if that was the question. So uh, if you're working in the concept art department, a lot, I know a lot of people using Blender. Uh, obviously it's less used in uh, uh, proper animation and, and film production because it's just uh, the main pipeline has been optimized around 3ds max on maya but i guess it's just a matter of time and also i mentioned this a lot of times like it's not like uh it's not like blender is the best software in the world you know some people like unfortunately it, be it became like a cult recently you know like it's like a blender cult it's a fantastic software because there are great people behind it i'm pretty sure there were there are still and there there were great people behind other packages but then people come and go you know and that's why some apps they go down they go up so it's pretty much like tomorrow someone else will come up with something else and i will be using it no like no doubt because i just appreciate the effort and i love the user experience that's what what is most important for me for me it doesn't brand isn't doesn't mean anything you know as long as i'm enjoying it like if i see something wrong with the app i will flag it straight away so just my take on that yeah 
for sure. Um, say from Alex, uh, hi Gemma, I do motion design, but making films has been my dream since childhood. In my free mm -hmm. time, I self-study concept art and uh, mm -hmm. pump up my fundamentals. My question is, how can a person without work experience in a film studio become a freelance concept artist in films? What portfolio mm -hmm. should one has to impress the studios? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's it's a very interesting question, isn't it? Because like most of the film studios you apply for, they ask for like a film experience, and then you don't have a film experience, so it's like a never-ending story. Uh, I mean, as a person who used to be involved in the hiring, let's first like start with the portfolio, and this is something like I tell a lot to my students. Like for example, if you look at my portfolio, this is a perfect example how portfolio shouldn't be, <laughs> because, and again, I'll explain why. Like you see, like when you look at my portfolio, there's so many different things, right? Like I do, like there's professional work, there's like 3D, there are tutorials, like so confusing. But the reason why I am i don't spend time organizing my portfolio because I'm already employed, you know, like I'm, my portfolio is more like, hey guys, this is what I'm doing. It's not like I'm not trying to sell my skill set or anything like that here. So if you're like getting into industry and just starting out or like, trying to get into it make sure your portfolio is very nicely sorted out uh, what i mean by that is that like it's very clear what you do for example let's say if you do only environments and this is what you're good at just leave environment work right uh and then make sure you've got like i i did a little bit of that here like you see like i've got some folders here uh make sure like you have a very dis distinct folders for example environment uh, environments characters or you can Obviously, you can categorize categorize it as you want. Like, for example, you can say just professional work and personal work. But as long as people are hiring at you, because you need to understand usually when people hire you, or when people are looking for someone to hire, we don't have much time. Like, our director scrolling through thousands of portfolios a day. They have probably five, they even maybe two minutes to look at your stuff. So usually it looks like this. Like, okay, this guy, uh, next, right? Or uh, you go like, Oh, this guy, he's awesome, right? And then they start like looking more carefully at your work. That's why like you need to make sure you put out your best work out there. Uh, for example, I often see this when uh, people put everything they do, uh, like they do like a little landscape studies and the, and the studies could look fantastic. But again, uh, as a concept artist, you want to also showcase your design skills. So it's not only about your painting skills. So it's always great to put them in, in folders. You know, if you're doing studies, put them in a separate folder. If you're doing like figure drawings, put them in, in the in the separate folder. So every, everything needs to be clear and make sure you have only the best work. You better have three pieces and they're all fantastic rather than having like 20 and some of them are very mediocre because it's a, just a human tendency when you, Looking for portfolio, let's say you have 10 great works and one really mediocre one, you start hesitating. Like, oh, if I hire this person, is he going to do like 10 awesome ones or he's going to pull out like this bad one that, that he has in his portfolio? So, first with the portfolio, make sure you have like subfolders, everything is super crystal clear what you do and how you position, like how you uh, present yourself. And then also make sure you have the best work uh, possible. And the final thing, you also need to show that you are a designer if you want a concept art position. Because most of the time, yes, as a final product, we do paintings, like beautiful drawings and paintings. But most of it goes through a very design-heavy pipeline, you know, where people give you feedback. And it's always like back and forth, uh, collaborate, collaborative work. That's why, like, it's great to show that not only you can do final images, but you can you you need to show your process, how you get there, how you think about it, how you gather your references. So basically, you can, you can have like a little little breakdowns of the way you do your stuff. You know, you can post like a final image, and under the final image, you can do like your ideation process, like your reference gathering, because this is also very important. You know, especially these days when like you go on art station, everybody's spitting out this great work, uh, but then. When I hire you, I uh, as an art director, I, I I want to make I I need to make sure that you also like you also know how to go start from very loose sketches towards the, the final work because basically that's the process uh, when you are uh, working on a real project. And 
finally with your question how to get into industry there are different methods you know like again like your work should speak for yourself uh, like your work should be good enough so just by looking at, at people who are working in the industry you can and looking at your work you don't need anyone to tell you that your work is not as good as the work you're looking at right like you can just that could be like a benchmark for you let's say it's either my work or a lot of other uh, great artists out there who are working in industry you can look at your work and just try to match the quality once you have it obviously you somehow need to get in touch with those people right and this is where there's also there are a lot of ways to do it first way obviously is a passive one you when you just put out your stuff on on art station and hopefully someone will see it but then you need to understand like art station or any other like internet portfolio websites they're very busy right because there's a lot of other artists trying to do the same so it's i i always recommend people getting direct contacts with not even with hr because hr most of the time they also not artists so they don't know all the fine nuances that art directors have so you kind of somehow need to get directly in touch with those people and these days, it's easier to do that, right? For example, you even on this channel, you have fantastic people who are working in the industry. Some of them are like in hiring positions. So just tr talking with them occasionally, showing them their wor uh, your work could be a very, like pretty much a direct contact. Also like visiting workshops, which we don't have this year, but I'm pretty sure one day they will resume doing those. So you can actually meet people who work there and then this would be like a direct contact for you. But obviously you can also do indirect contacts like for example just like being in a community someone could see your work and refer your you to someone uh, that's exactly how it happened to me back in the days when i was looking for work and a friend of mine andre Moulin, he helped me with this he recommended for a job he was working on and that's how i ended up being in the industry so yeah nice uh, good answer. Um, from Noor, it says, Hey, Jama, thanks for taking the time to the live stream. Could you talk about how you got started at ILM? Did they contact you or did you prepare a portfolio and apply to them? Mm -hmm. I guess they're curious how you got the job there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, actually, uh, with ILM specifically, it was exactly the way I described you. It was just from people I knew, and then they were looking for work, uh, for someone, and when they brought it up, the person I knew was like, hey, I know Jama. And they were like, oh, yeah, we know Jama. And then we started talking, and then that's how I ended up there. So I did not apply um, my, uh, my portfolio. So it's basically through people I know. And, you know, when I say people I know, it's not like everything happening through friends, but you don't need to be friends with people. They, like I, it happened multiple times to me when I would see someone, someone's work online, and maybe we'd have a couple of very quick, like uh, chats online, or we would meet each other somewhere else. I, I wouldn't call a person my friend. Some, it would be just someone I know. But because his work, his or her work is fantastic, and when someone would ask me if I know someone with specific skill, and I would go, oh, well, there's this person, you know? So it's basically like very important to uh, be in this community, you know, to be active and to talk with people. But obviously, again, this is not related to your question, but this is something I always feel like I need to mention. You need to know the boundaries, you know, some people become too pushy and it happened to me and I know it happens occasionally in, this, in the industry where people, hey can you rec recommend me to this guy i was like no because he's not my friend and like and most of the time it i know it sucks it's a bitter truth but most of the time people doing that they're not good you know like if you're good and if your work is fantastic you don't need to push like you just need to kind of nudge a little bit and i go oh yeah i'm i'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to help you but uh, most of the time people doing that they're not that good and they read some books where they've been told to be very active to be pushy to believe in themselves and instead of doing their homework they start just pushing and trying to get hired this this becomes very annoying and, and again i had a couple of experiences like that i don't mind de dealing with that but it's just not very professional and once like you would never talk with that person again you know so be careful about that and i just wanted to warn you uh because this is something that happens especially with this world where 
you can directly get, get in touch. Like on Facebook, I have my phone number. You can like literally pick up your phone, call me, and then go like, hey, Jamma, like, can you look at my stuff? But most of the time, people think that they are not there yet, you know? And when you tell this to them, it just hurts on both ends. So make sure you know your boundaries, right? Um, okay, let's see here. Um, Ryoma is asking, what universal truths have you observed in reality that is, a, that is applied to your creative product? Universal truth. <laughs> I think actually, that, Ryoma, I love you, but he's asking this question to every person we have. So, yeah, that's uh, cool. Well, I, I guess I, w- I, w- I would tell you that I don't know yet. So I'm still looking for that truth, but I can share some. Uh, very recent and by recent i would say three four years been happening to me uh the experience that has been happening to me is that becoming successful becoming financially good and all this stuff doesn't make you happy that's what i figured out you know you can be working on the best projects in the world you can be doing good financially you could be actually like 10 years ago what you dreamt of or all of it like realized materialized but you're still not happy and this is like something it's not con- like your happiness is not connected to material things it's you can be you can be ch- just starting out uh, not having a job but you could be way more happier than for example some other people who accomplish something so right now i'm just working on my happiness basically so the truth i'm trying to find is how to be happy <laughs> and uh I'm getting closer, you know, because like, especially this is the, the one of the reasons why I wanted to share my personal projects, you know, where some of them then like just me doing them with no reward, at least when I started it out, but because I'm loving it so much, it makes me happy, you know, and the moment it makes you happy, you spend more time on it and it just like starts exponentially growing into something big, bigger so i guess like make being how to be a happy person would be the truth that i'm still trying to discover i'm not there yet the moment i do that i will share with you guys um thanks all right one more um we actually have a lot more so you tell me uh, how far you want to go okay so one more question is um thanks for the q a um uh, i just wanted to ask how applicable is grease pencil in its current stage of development to actual concept art production pipeline is it efficient enough what are the drawbacks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh it is very efficient because you can do very quick scribbles i occasionally use it not as much as i want to because the only drawback right now is that i think like grease pencil will shine when they implement vr workflow because right now when you're working with a grease pencil like it's you're still painting on a flat plane right like every time you meet you can offset your strokes but you obviously need to rotate your camera and all that stuff so i think like once they implement vr and i i did a few demos with uh blender vr i had a a version of blender which was which basically had vr support built in it wasn't the official build unfortunately but I tried it and it was fantastic. It just was exactly what I w- was thinking it would be. You know, you can pick up grease pencil and you can draw in 3D space. And once it happens, it will become a very powerful tool because Blender again is it like a Swiss knife. You know, like you have on top of this, you have modeling, you have real time rendering, and all those good things. So yeah, again, but it, most of the time. Again, grease pencil is just another tool. You know, in order to use it, you need to know how to draw, and you need to know, like, design and perspective and all those things. So it makes things easier. But if you don't know how to draw, it becomes a very useless tool anyway. So again, I, I think like one thing missing right now is just VR. Once they they get a VR support, so it's gonna shine in a and, uh... capacity. The, the follow-up is that if you actually use it yourself uh, for professional work specifically? Uh, uh, right now, like, I haven't done any, like, most of the time I think, like, I would use it would be more like a hard surface stuff. I haven't mm-hmm. done that type of work for quite some time because I've been more in the creature, like, organic stuff, involved in more organic stuff. But if I would do, like, for example, uh, like a Mac or, like, some sort of, like, a mechanical vehicle, uh, hard surface stuff i would definitely use it because you can just quickly block out like a 
simple shape and then instead of refining those details by modeling them you can first uh, sketch them out with grease pencil just to see the proportions so i i guess like you i don't use it purely because i don't have projects uh that will fit that that workflow if i would do something like this i'll definitely use it um cool so one question from uh sina um uh -huh. hi Gemma. thanks for doing the stream how do you plan your projects for designing a full scene so that all the designs fit together in the same world and go well with each other oh that's the most tricky one <laughs> so i'm not sure if i fully got the question because it depends like is it a personal project is it a professional one uh, if it is a professional one uh i mean everything you design fits the world that you're working on, which is predefined by the brief you're working on, right? Like let's say if you're working on a StarCraft movie or a game, the world the world was, was already there. You know you know how things should look like and you stick with the brief. I mean, if you, you, but then again, if you're doing this for your personal project, you pretty much do the same thing. First, you come up with the brief for your world. Like let's say you have a desert planet and then that drives everything you do, right? That's how it becomes something like unified you know because it needs to be created within this one world so defining like i guess like defining boundaries is would be the the uh, the, the answer for this question you know uh if you're working with the professional cli clients they give you the boundaries they tell you okay we're doing a world on this planet or we're doing like we're de de developing this city in this time period of time and that that's that is like a boundary for your pro uh, project. Uh, uh, with the personal ones, again, you pretty much do the same, but you will set th those boundaries instead of uh, a client setting them up for you. Once you have the boundaries, everything you do will have the same, will, will be basically based on the same world. Yeah. Um, one question from Dimitri says, yeah. um, hi Gemma, uh, could you please, uh, do you have a, basically do you have any uh, good tutorials for Adobe Medium, and uh, are you going to share your approach? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Like, do you, if you, I guess, like, I'm not sure if the question is if you use Adobe Medium. I, I do. Well, all these sculptures are done in Adobe Medium. I okay. Guess, like, that, that's what Mitri is asking about. Uh, I don't have any tutorials that I've done myself uh, because I've been just playing with this constantly, like maybe starting this year. Uh, there are a lot of tutorials out there, though, uh, if you just go uh, uh, on YouTube. But I, I will sh I'll share my workflow at some point for sure. It's it's nothing different. It's pretty much similar to what other guys do. Maybe I have like a couple of things I, I, I do differently. But most of the time, even if you, you see me, unfortunately, I don't have my Oculus connected right now. I'll show it right now, but obviously we're also running out of time. Uh, you will see that it's not the way I do things. It's the it's what I know is is it, what, what makes things different. You know, when you like sculpting characters, you need to understand gesture. You need to understand like a little bit of anatomy and proportions and all those things. That the rest becomes just tools. You know, like you know what you want to do with your character or with your pose and stuff like that. And then you use medium which has a very simple set of tools to kind of come up with it. But I, I will share it. I'll share my process at some point. Right now, I'm just so busy with other stuff that that's why I'm, I wasn't able to do like a proper medium tutorial. Cool. Um, one more question. Uh, a transfer is asking. Um, is basically asking if you were starting today, uh, with all the content available online today, and with all the mm -hmm. online schools and everything there is, um, basically, uh, what would you start with in order? Regarding subject, I guess is what like the question. I guess is is basically mm -hmm. like what, where to like, start from. Like, what would you start from? I guess would you do something maybe different that you did in the past with like mm -hmm. how the scene is structured today with the online mm -hmm. courses, classes, mm -hmm. and tutorials and whatnot. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't do anything differently because I think I early down in my career I figure out what needs to be done first, and first obviously is what fundamentals. You know, you gotta build a very strong foundation, and I think like it's a bit more difficult to do these days because everything there's a lot of just like oh this is how you do it you know people don't actually spend time figuring it out themselves but i like i was very isolated when i was starting my career so everything i learned i had to go really to the bottom of things you know i was i had to really understand the foundation fundamentals 
of everything I was studying. So if you're starting out today, start with foundation. You know, what is foundation? It's not, you don't, it's, I don't mean like just draw cubes with charcoal, right? You just need to understand foundation of art, you know, like perspective, which obviously will include drawing cubes with charcoal, but uh, it's just getting the foundation right is a very key factor here because once you get the foundation right, the rest becomes just tools, you know? Like if you know proportions, if you know design principles, if you know composition, anatomy and all those things, the tools, they will keep changing, keep evolving, right? ZBrush for AD code tomorrow, there will be some other apps in VR on iPad, doesn't matter. You will pick them up very quickly as long as you have very strong foundations. So today, if you're starting out, start with your foundation, you know, it's just fundamental things and then slowly put additional skills on top of it, you know, like if you, want to get into 3D modeling, obviously having a strong design sense is very important before you even open 3D. You know, otherwise you can learn tools, but then you will, I'm not sure if it will, you it will, like basically, again, you start from the bottom. First you sort out the fundamentals and then slowly you put every layer on top basically. Uh, and I, like, I have to admit, it's very difficult probably to do it these days because there's so much information pouring out at you but again it's i guess like it's everyone's personal journey you know like you get all the information that that's being fed to you and then you filter it down and you try to figure out what's important for you at a very specific stage of your career um so i like this question uh we we have this all the time too um it's uh what is a typical day for you. Can you talk about your daily schedule? Basically, a day in the life of Jama. Yeah, a day in the life of Jama. Well, I, you saw my daily studies, so I I tr I try to do them. Usually, I do them in morning in the morning, like when I'm just very fresh. So, and I don't drink coffee, so I don't have those times where I wake up very destroyed. <laughs> like I don't know, like I'm not a coffee man for some reason. So I wake up and uh, before I start my professional work, I just open like Photoshop. I start drawing like little things. Oh, I open 3D. Like most of the stuff that I showed you in Quick Shape, it's something that took me quite a while to figure out. You know, like I would do something and then I'll take notes. Like, oh, I would love to have something like this. I would love to do this, that, and this. And then that really helps me to kind of over the time to create bigger things because every day I'm spending on, on something. Then obviously I do my professional work. Usually, obviously it's eight hours a day, uh, and then oh my god, and then I I work again because <laughs> like uh, I, I I do my personal projects. But obviously, I would say I'm not a role model when it comes to organizing my day. Like it's I'm terrible. I'm like a big procrastinator. I'm terrible with my time management, and a lot of things I do, I'm so slow, right? Like I literally like often complain to my wife like I'm telling mom, why am I so slow? But she always encouraged me saying, because you're doing great things. And I was like, yes, exactly. And then I go back and I <laughs> grind again, right? So don't don't worry if you're too slow. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. Like if you're, if you feel like you're very slow, it's just the way it is. You know, you eventually get faster, but what is important is just that journey you're going through. So I, at some point I just realized I don't have a ability to organize my day and to be super efficient, which was really kind of bothering me. And I just let it go. I was like, oh, screw it up. I don't want to be very organized. I, organized. I will do my best and see how it goes. And I felt relieved, you know, I felt like much better because in the end I wasn't like blaming myself or playing some games or not working on something i was just well let it take 10 years instead of five doesn't matter like as long as you enjoy your process uh this is what what matters you know that's why i whatever i do if i have like i guess like if i would give you a little bit of advice i would say do a short-term project like i would never commit to projects that will have like a, a year deadline right i will it, even if it's going to take a year, I will break it down into smaller steps. That's what will help me to stay focused. Because if it's a very long, like far away deadline, it's easy to kind of procrastinate and also 
to lose kind of motivation as you go. That's why like short term projects is very good remedy for that. And then you don't kill yourself over like uh, m- m- being super strict with your schedule. As long as you're enjoying the process, you sh- it should be fine. So that's the way I do it. And probably this is not the role model, as I, again, as I <laughs> mentioned. I'm pretty sure there are people who are very organized and way more successful. But at least what I stopped having, and this is something I touched up on, I stopped being stressed, you know, like when you kind of feel you need to do this and that, and, and, and it just kills you, you know, like physically, mentally, it drains you. And this is not the place you want to be. Yeah, I love the answer uh, because I think that everyone should find whatever works for themselves and not try to copy exactly. another person just because they like that person. Exactly. It's always um, like, yeah, yeah, I totally no. agree with you. You know, it's your personal journey. You know, it doesn't matter how many examples you see around you. You need to understand you are special. And I'm not saying this is not like just me trying to make a motivational speech here, but every person is is unique you know like you got to find your own way of doing things sometimes it's very close to what other people has done before you yeah. have done before you but most of the time it's your personal journey like you might be very slow but eventually if you keep doing things you speed up and you become fast but again try to just enjoy this journey that's what what makes it this profession very interesting you know it's very fun to do yeah totally agree um and MD is asking if Blender makes 3D code obsolete in your workflow. I no, no. They're just very different. Like I still do a lot of paint painting, uh, texture paint in 3D code. And 3D code is also fantastic for like very organic cuts, you know. So certain things I definitely do in 3D code. But obviously Blender, again, it, it's such a universal application, you know, like you can re- like do very quick like low poly modeling then you can do sculpting then you can do real-time rendering so i guess like what blender uh, introduced to my workflow is that now finally i can use less software like back in the days you had to know everything and it becomes very difficult to tackle you know like you have to export import stuff it's not perfect uh, but it's it's a sufficient enough uh, sufficient for me for what i do that's why I still think 3D code is a fantastic software and I, I'm I'm actually like using it not as much as I used to do, but quite a lot. So it has still has a lot of potential. It's just a fantastic uh, software as well. Um Jewelor is asking, uh, are you going to shoot your own film one day? <laughs> I I think I can uh, potentially I will, maybe. I don't know. Like you know, for me the biggest problem with shooting a film is not the I just don't have any ideas, you know. I think like film is is a big commitment, and if I would want to do that, I would love to do it with a solid idea behind it, you know. So it's not just like a bunch of visual effects put together, you know, not just a very great design work put together. I would love to have some a strong idea behind a film, but I don't have any strong ideas yet, so I'm still like. I do have a few things that I have in my mind, but nothing is said yet. So if at some point I feel like I have, that would be a great story to tell, then I would probably get myself involved in that. Until then, probably not. Um, from Jatin Gupta. Hi, Jama. Thanks for your time. How do you tackle with art blocks and mental blocks uh, when you cannot focus and create what you really want to? Ah, yeah, that's a that's a great one, isn't it? I would say I don't know how to, how I tackle them. I I would say I do have those moments, but maybe what I have I do have them when I'm physically kind of tire myself. Like sometimes I work too much, I just like sit down in front of a computer and my brain goes like, dude, like get get some rest, right? But most of the time I'm I'm like I realize I'm quite motivated and very excited about things I do and probably because I switch over different things, you know, like to, to different type of work. Like for example, as I showed you here, like sometimes I do 2D, sometimes I do, I do 3D. I guess you get bored when you do the same thing all over again for many, many years, which I am doing, but it's still exciting because every time I'm trying different things and stuff like that. But 
if you feel uh, like again this is a proven fact if you feel like you exhausted and you have a mental block and you have uh, you don't have any like creative flow anymore just have a rest you know i know some for some of us it that rest means like a year or two i remember obviously you have in my career i felt like i didn't have any talent to do this type of work i, I literally felt like oh man those guys are so awesome and I, i'm not getting there and i gave up like in my world i gave up but it turned out i just took a like a, a year pose and after that pose i came back and i was like doing much better so sometimes it's just a matter of taking your time but change your subject as well you know like, like for example let's say you have this mental block when you're working uh, you're drawing and painting try 3d or try like reading books it doesn't necessarily need to be art related as well so just changing subjects sometimes often will help you um, and to help you to recover basically um tansir sensei is yeah. asking um, it's you're... it's Tunj Tunjer. It's a Turkish friend of mine. Oh, sorry. I, I, <laughs> I guess sometimes I'm butchering people's names. I just yeah. Well, that's but... totally fine. That's totally okay. Fine. So then it's Tunjer, Tunjer Sensei. Okay, so uh, he's asking, "Hey, Jama, is your course, um, you know, the one for Masters of Digital Painting, the mm -hmm. concept for film, is it more for people that already know Blender and want to transition into doing concept art for movies, or?" people that know concept art already and want to learn blender or be uh, yeah i would say no it's blender is just a tool which i show how to use i think it's it, it's basically more for people who work who want to get into movie industry uh, and i offer the course in three different levels uh like they and like beginner level if you never worked uh, in the industry for example most of the time it's either students or people who are just like starting not just starting out it's because i don't teach how to paint like in photoshop in my course from scratch you know like we you you gotta have some certain skills because we can we can spend more time on concentrating on storytelling on like composition like cinematic composition and all that stuff and blender just a, 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 a is just a tool if you don't know blender coming into my course i show like i teach how to use it uh, uh but the levels are um are basically the levels are different from each other by basically coming from your experience you know like the more experience you are we can skip all the basic stuff and, and this is where the professional uh, uh tier is you know and also i physically spend more time as tier goes up so for example with professional tier i spend more physical time uh working on the assignments and stuff like that. yeah Tunjer, feel free to ask me about the course afterwards if you didn't get what you're asking what, that you were asking, okay what you were asking for um so <clears throat> also also Tunjer, sorry i'm trying to not to butcher your name too much is asking do you sculpt now uh nowadays in vr and then import into blender for shader or just straight up in blender uh uh, no, I sculpt most of the time in VR. Uh, it's either Medium or uh, Gravity Sketch. And then I import them into uh, Blender to apply shaders just to uh, make them look like they're clay models, basically. But I start, I, I do some, like, I, I'm still not that good, but I, I kind of improved quite a lot in, in terms of just sculpting in Blender. It's getting better and better, uh, definitely. It's just... Uh, really exciting times you know they have a great team behind it so hopefully at one point you will i will be able just to do everything in blender that would be uh awesome as well but again like vr sculpting has its own advantages you know you can get very nice gestures and stuff like that so again the bottom line is that these are just tools you know like and i tackle those tools coming from just purely from what i i need like if I need something very quick and gestural, I and I know VR handles it better, I will do it there, and then I will swap to Blender. If I need, for example, something more detailed, I will just go to ZBrush and do it there. So, as long as you kind of like know what you want, those tools, each one of those tools, they offer something like a faster solution, and you can swap tools whenever you need them. Um, one question from <laughs> Diligent Farmer. Uh, what are some other features you'd like to see in Blender? Um, it's uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like what I have right now, it's it's enough for me. I guess like 
something that I tried and I mentioned, uh, VR support would be fantastic. I mean, they already have VR, uh, but not right now. You can just view stuff in VR. If you go here, and maybe I don't have the latest build, but somewhere here you can go. I, I don't have VR connected. So basically when you connect VR headset, you can look at your, at your scene uh, in VR. Uh, but then I would love like proper functionality to build in. Uh, and as I mentioned, I already had a build which already had very primitive uh, tools in VR. Once they map everything, that's going to be fantastic because, yeah, you can basically model and almost do like real-time previews in, in Blender, which would be fantastic. So, But then also, I like with the, with the team they have right now, I already trust them. And because so far they've been rolling out these fantastic tools, you know, like so instead of... Like, you know, usually what, what it becomes most of the time, you do a successful app and then people start demanding, do this for me, do that for me. And like all the time, what developers do, they just develop those tools instead of try, trying to be innovative. So I, I just like, I would love them to develop their own kind of vision and then see how, how it goes. It's also very nice. So VR would be the only one probably I would look, will be, would be looking forward to have in maybe next year or end of this year. And uh, maybe you tell me, John, maybe we take like three, four uh, more or yeah. again, it's all up to you. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can do it for you, for four more. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I guess one more from uh, Tensor. Is that he has a lot of good questions, I guess. Uh, he's asking, is it, good, is it good idea to have a single type of style if you're trying to get in the industry? Like meaning you're like either fully realistic, not have any mm -hmm. stylized work or, you know, for instance, having stylized work is basically... Um, like would having both confused directors and studios? Uh, uh, interesting question, isn't it? I guess like style the, is not that important when you're working as a designer, you know, like because in the end what matters is the design work that you do. Uh, could style, for, let's, let's just take like a very simple example here. Like let's say you, you are very graphic, right? Like your style is very graphic. And on a on a movie that they are hiring for, they need a realistic style. Then obviously you probably would be a good candidate. But maybe there will be a movie where they will need exactly in your style. So I always put it this way: like you, having a style is important. It's great, and it puts a value on you as an artist. It's it's both financially, like let's say you can make X amount of money, and both like your value as an artist, right? Let, let's put it as X, right? And then on top of that, you also, you are a good designer, right? Then it becomes like another X. So could you have both? So if you have both, you basically, you have a value of two X. So it's really up to you. So whenever like people ask me if you do, you do need your own style, I, I would say no, but if you have it, it's great, you know, because then you can only do work that will be where people would come to you because of your style you know you don't need to adapt to any kind of other different like uh visual styles and whatnot so but most of the time style is not very dominant in in concept art you know because in the end what matters is just the design work so i like for example i do have my own style uh but then again i can do work in any other styles as well because uh, you basically expand the amount of projects you can work on when you are not very attached to your style. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's uh, it does. Um, let's see here. Um, Arcane Raccoon is asking, Hey, Jama, great to have you here. My question, what are the main differences between American, Russian, and European industries, gaming, movies, animation? And if yes, what are uh, what are they... And which one would you say is better to look forward to? <laughs> that's a that's a good one. I, I could say I, I don't know anything I don't know anything about the Russian industry. I have a lot of friends and obviously family out there, but I, I never worked there, so I I I don't have I don't know much about the market there. So that uh, leaves us just with two markets, American and uh, European. I would say they're both great. It, the main difference would be just numbers right like for example the the pay is better in, in us and the pay is less in europe so 
uh, but the projects are very same. You know, like most of the projects are being shipped sh shipped over to Europe from US. Like for example, when you're working on films, most of the films actually, on most recent films, they've been done here in in the UK. So and also in, in other European countries. But there's also a lot of work there in America, especially in game studios and films as well. So the main difference would be pay, but this was this is also the subject could, that could be very, not confusing, but at least not for people who are not in the industry, could be very uh, interesting to hear my take on. Yes, the, the, the market in the US, uh, the, the pay in the US is better, but you, do, you need to remember that your expenses in the us are, are, are bigger as well like for example if you live in in uk or in euro you pay less you get paid less uh but then you spend less so it's kind of like almost directly proportional to each other but then again with to, today you can be you don't need to be you, for example you can be working from home you don't need to be uh, in either of those you can be living somewhere in Uzbekistan and doing work for Hollywood clients and getting paid in, in US money, it is possible. So, uh, especially with COVID, you know, with where this thing, the whole freelance world has been tested properly, you know, many studios realize they don't need people on site, you know, so I'm, 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 excited, I'm, I'm really excited how this plays out, you know, because this will probably potentially shift our world towards remote work, you know, uh, and see how it goes. But if I would have to choose to work, for example, originally I'm from Tajikistan, but I work in London. Why do I do that? Like I can right now, I can go back, can have my expenses very little, and do like a very paid work, very well paid work. But I still prefer to be here in Europe because the industry is here. You know, you can surround yourself with the uh, with the artists who are as good as you and most of them are better than you it's just like pure inspiration i think you know like it's not only money side of things it's also being surrounded by best people in the world that's why i that's what i always wanted to do you know like uh yes the financial part of it is very important but i i just enjoy the process of being surrounded by this talented people because you can learn so much you know like if you work in a studio and next to you, there's a guy who, who's like fantastic, phenomenal artist himself. You just learn so much, you know, like you surround yourself with people who are better than you and then you grow. That would be, that was always the main driver for me. You know, that's always something that I was looking forward to. Nice. Okay. A few more, by the way, guys, there's a lot of questions about Blender. Um, but again, I'm sure that if you check out um jama's content you can also find uh, the answer to some of those questions anyway um one question from arlan says uh what are some new things on the art horizon you're looking forward to uh, such as ai new technology new software maybe a new magic brush <laughs> that's a good one actually gav knows more than i do about this yeah i'm looking forward to ai you know like i've been playing with uh this ai driven uh app from nvidia and it's fantastic what you can see a lot of potential you know like i and you saw a little a little glimpses of that today as i was talking like my job is not for example to model this stone wall here right i would love to have an app where i can go like can you make this a stone wall and it will make it as a stone wall so i think like ai will be getting more and more heavily implemented in our workflow to take care of all this very primitive boring routine work you know like for example if you're doing a painting let's say i'm working on star wars and i'm doing a painting over like as some sort of a landscape you don't want to spend two hours on painting a stone in the foreground right i would love to have an app like can you paint a stone there just paint the shape and boom the stone appears there so if if i have if i would have something like this i would spend my time more on the kind of global picture i i, I can put all my effort into creative process. So I think AI is going to be fantastic. You know, like, for example, as a character artist, a lot of us, like, you paint, we paint a lot of, like, faces for the background characters. I would love to have an app to just to tell it, like, can you put, like, a couple of character, generic characters in the background and then just boom, boom, populate them. That would be fantastic. So, yes, like, occasionally people ask me, what, but isn't it, like, mm, 
cutting the branch you're sitting on top. No, it's not. I'm not sitting on the branch where I need to paint the stones, like the the texture over here. I'm. It will kind of remove unnecessary, very boring routine work, which eventually any kind of technology does, right? Like, for example, cars came out. Now we don't need to walk everywhere, right? Planes, we can fly. Same with AI. It will just save our time and hopefully, like some jobs will be cut, obviously, but this is unavoidable. You know, you, you can't avoid that. It's just you can't stop the progress. And that's why, like, I'm very positive about AI things. If, to, to be more precise, what I'm looking for, to be honest, I don't know, uh, because it, it developed, it's developing very rapidly, whatever is out there. But what I'm looking for, and this is something I've been advocating like all the time, I'm looking forward to having artists be a bit, a little bit more open, I guess, a bit less conservative, because every, like I can see the tendency every time something new comes out, people like, ah, this is not good, or this is very gimmicky and stuff like that. Let those guys play, right? Like, for example, let's say AI-driven painting software. Obviously, the first version wouldn't be as good as, like, Photoshop or as good as you can do it, but give it some time. It, it will get there. It's just we need a collaborative, very strong environment where we as an artist, we should help developers, and only then we can come up with something cool. So that, that's my take on the things. Nice. Um, one second. I have literally a jet airplane going over me right now. <laughs> that's crazy. Has it gone? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's super loud. Um, okay. So I guess um, maybe we can take one more. And again, I feel bad for you know skipping some questions. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, but, no, go ahead. I, I don't know if this was the... Uh, the Arlan I know, I know one Arlan, and he asked me the question about what I'm looking for. I'm actually looking mm -hmm. forward to another Central Asian cloth we had the other day, so not to do it to the next technology. <laughs> oh, sure. But maybe it's a different Arlan, I don't know. <laughs> so. Okay, so, um, okay, one, okay, I'm going to read this one from Tyler. It says, how do you get your pieces to look so cinematic? Are you constantly looking at film stills? Uh, looking at their color grading, value sliding, and so on. And do you do composition mm -hmm. studies from films or other sources? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, this is uh, actually the, something that I really like. Spend, we spend like some like significant time on that. Uh, I will just like quickly explain here. Like for example, let me let me open just any kind of environment kind of image here. Like for example, this one, right? Uh, so, like, when I was starting out my career, I always felt like color grading is what makes films look like film, you know? Like, when you look at, like, the Gladiator or Aliens or Terminator, you go, oh, man, this color grading is fantastic. That's what makes film <laughs> films look like film. But obviously, once I, I learned this properly, I realized, obviously, color grading has a little bit of effect on the way that your picture looks. But most of it is coming from a composition. So when you look at the cinematic frames, the way they compose the image, this is what makes uh, makes it look like a, like a cinematic shot. And in, in order to achieve that, obviously you need to understand cameras, you need to understand lensing, and you need to understand light. You basically don't have that many variables. It's one of them is like your camera, where you place your camera, and another one is your light, right? Like for example, over here you can see like the way I, the way I put my camera and the way I kind of uh, rec created my light uh, is what contributes to the sensation of looking at the cinematic frames. So oh, oh, definitely looking at the film frames helps you, uh, but obviously you need go, to go deeper than that, you know, because you don't, you, you, you not only want to learn how to just copy certain film frames, you need to learn how to decompose them into like a very specific decision-making makings that those guys did when they they were filming it so for example if you're looking at a, a a frame like you need to understand why did we place our camera specifically here like for example this frame i specifically positioned my camera over here because i wanted to be kind of walking with these guys like right so this is where like you need to learn about position of your camera is it like eye level is it like low angle is it high angle so all those things like uh you definitely can learn it just by looking at film frames, but if I was you, I would just 
dig deeper you know there's a lot of books about it like uh, on composition in general and again it doesn't necessarily need to be film composition you can pick up like any kind of master work like from a painters from like 16th like 18th century you can see they apply a lot of apply a lot of same similar rules and then because they are so universal composition rules once you learn how to kind of see those in your uh, in movie frames you will you will be able to uh, replicate those in your own frames as well so yeah awesome uh again there's a lot of questions guys uh sorry i skipped some of some of them I'm trying to sort of uh uh, you know, pick a good variety. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jama, for uh, taking the time to no uh, come here and share your experience and knowledge with all of us. Yeah. And uh, thanks, you, thank you so much for answering so many questions. Usually, uh, it's it's usually the case where uh, you know <laughs> we we could have we could keep probably asking you questions asking you questions yeah. no, for uh, I'm, I'm, I'm for another four four hours. You know, so. I'm happy to do this. You know, and uh, this is something we talked about it. Uh, very briefly you know it's very exciting these days that you can actually get in touch with just professions working in it back in this it was very difficult it wasn't yeah. like i could pick up a phone and ask like ryan church like hey ryan like how do you do this right yeah, like, it was like really difficult so, but then again there's always up and downs you know back in the days we didn't have much like opportunity to ask people that's why we had to learn by, uh, by hard like hard way these days you can ask anything. That's why I, I feel like people often just scratch the surface instead of going really deep and trying to understand it. So my advice would be like, ask as many people as you want, but also spend your own time doing your homework, you know? Yeah. Because it is very important, you know? And again, like today I showed you like a lot of work that I never posted any, anywhere, but I spent so much time on doing it, you know? That's why it is important to put in physical hours and it shouldn't be driven by just your desire to expose yourself or to share with other people, which is a fantastic tool again, but it's all about balance. Some things, they just need pure grind, ugly sketches, a lot of time, a lot of failures, a lot of time you hating yourself because you're not accomplishing something, but multiply that by a constant effort. It, you will get somewhere and it's so, so rewarding because next time you post it uh like in a year after a year of studying and doing all the hard work you will see the reaction and people go like wow this is looking great yeah yeah and um we also i mean as usual usually when when we're, we're towards the end um you know uh we basically hook up the the the, the guests so you, if you want to share like where people can follow you your gum roads basically all the good yeah. stuff uh, yeah, sure. But this is my uh, uh, art station, and uh, basically on my art station, if you want to learn about something, I, I do have a lot of tutorials. If you want to like find out more precisely what you want, how you do certain things, like for example, you can click on this on how to create, create cinematic lighting using textures. There's a link to my Gumroad. You can just find it there. So I, right now, I'm like basically. All of my stuff is on the art station because I can automatically update it. You know, like updating it on my own website, it just takes so much time and effort. So this is the main place. And here you can learn from me. You can find like my tutorials and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, maybe another time in the future, uh, I'm sure that a lot of people here would kill to have a, another live stream in the future where you're maybe painting something or doing something. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, absolutely, absolutely. I would definitely looking forward to sharing more stuff awesome. uh, with, with, with the guys. And I, again, like I, I would thank you for organizing this stream and also creating this environment for artists to uh, be communicating with, you, with each other. It reminds oh. me of all good forum times, you know, when- Yeah, that's that's why I created it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, so it's it's really, really nice, you know, when you can ask people around and just like being in community gives you a lot of motivation. So. Thank yeah, no, I, I uh, t totally agree. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, so thank you so much again, uh, Jama. Um, yeah. So again, this this will be posted on the on the on the YouTube just for people that have missed the live stream. Mm -hmm. And um, again, thank you again so 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 much. Uh, it was an amazing talk and and great answers. 
and um, to all the people uh, listening, uh, we'll announce our next guest uh, next week. So stay tuned. And thank you so much again, once again, Jama. And thank you so much for, for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you again. Have a great weekend, guys. Thanks, Jama. You too. Yeah. Thank you.